My name is Jeff Chi. Um, I'm the current chairman of the uh, Singapore Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. Uh, we are an association of about 150 members, uh, of which uh, uh, more than half, I would say, are, are investing members, what we call full corporate members. Uh, the membership currently accounts for, uh, we estimate, about 60% of uh, assets under management uh, out of Singapore. Um, uh, so, and the association was founded uh, 23 years ago. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, the, the earlier session talked a little bit about role in, in government. Uh, the association, the founding member of the association was actually the Economic Development Board of Singapore. So, so, so it was a lot of foresight in, 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 in saying, let's get an ecosystem started, let's put together an association and, 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 and get this thing off the ground. Uh, my day job, uh, I'm a venture capitalist. Uh, I'm a managing director of Vickers Venture Partners. We're a partnership of five people. Uh, we're a pan-Asian fund, about about 200 million, just shy of 200 million uh, of committed capital. Uh, we've invested about 160 of that over the last 10 years. We started 10 years ago. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. And uh, current valuation, we estimate about 900 million, so out of that. So, so that just gives you an overview. Uh, if there's anyone interested in finding out more, I'm happy to spend some time offline. So the topic today is really about the future of venture. So, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, two things. Uh, one, I think, is a, is, is a regional shift. Uh, and, and, and I think earlier we, we saw some slides demonstrating that. And the other is some, some uh, new venture models that, that we have already seen uh, coming onto the scene. So in terms of a, of, of a regional shift, I think, I think the first thing is, is the last 10 years or so, we've seen this big move uh, in terms of venture investing. I wouldn't say out of US and out of Europe, but we've seen Asia increasing in size. Uh, when I first started in this business 10 years ago uh, and looking at investing in China, China was, I, remember, I even remember writing the slides. So China was like number the fifth or sixth largest uh, venture market globally. Uh, today it is, it is uh, without doubt the number two uh, in terms of size. Uh, and, and number three is actually quite far, far away. So, so China's dominance has, has in, in, in Asia has, has created quite a bit of activity in the region. India, uh, uh, a little behind, not too far behind. But the more recent years, especially the last three or four years, we've seen a big emergence in Southeast Asia. And so, and so I think that is uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about. So, so 10 years ago, it was, uh, it was about the BRIC nations. Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, the, a lot of the LPs are now asking what's after the brick. Uh, one of the slides you saw earlier showed that, showed that the payouts from Asian VC funds, uh, in particular the Chinese and the Indian funds, because that has formed the bulk of it, uh, have not been all that attractive. So LPs are now looking towards new markets, what's, what's next in their thinking. And, and we in Southeast Asia have seen increased attention. So, so we're getting a fund of funds, endowments, uh, beginning to set up presence, sending people to, to, to scout the area, looking for uh, general partner relations that, that they, they can build. Um, so really in terms of venture, we see Southeast Asia coming of age, right? It is, you know, I, the, the statistics are there. Most of you know them already, 600 million people, uh, a growing middle class, uh, 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 decent uh, GDP growth, uh, all those are make, make, make Southeast Asia a very attractive uh, uh, target for, for investing in venture. So these are some of the numbers. Uh, we've seen Southeast Asia venture quadruple in the last four to five years. So four or five years ago, if you ask me how large is venture in Southeast Asia, it was running about $250 million. Uh, the last two years, we've crossed a billion. Um, the numbers you see in 2014 are little, uh, actually some records show that 2014 was larger than 2015. Uh, it was the timing of the transaction and, and all that. So it depends on who you ask. Uh, and, and really, you know, wearing my uh, association hat, Singapore has been uh, at, at the core of all this, right? So, so you see 46% of Southeast Asian transactions basically involving 
uh, either Singapore funding or Singapore related companies. So, so they have, uh, so 46% is uh, Singapore into Singapore companies. Uh, these are not just uh, Singapore markets. These are uh, because of the uh, regulatory and, and, and infrastructure uh, benefits that Singapore companies have. Uh, even the Southeast Asian deals, uh, some of the Indonesian deals that you see are structured as, a, as, as Singapore companies. Indonesia, in terms of venture investments, is a, is a distant second at about 20%. Then you have Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, you know, in, in the teens or so. So, so that gives you a flavor of, of the size of Southeast Asian venture. Um, uh, you can cut the data a few ways. You can look at uh, the amount of money, where money's flowing from. Uh, one of the interesting things that Singapore has uh, is, that, is that despite accounting for 60% uh, uh, 60% of venture uh, investments into the region, uh, actually Singapore-based managers contribute to only to around 16% of that. And the reason is because uh, uh, over the last few years, Singapore has, has with, the, with the building of the NRF and, and some of the schemes that you heard about earlier, uh, build a network of global investors, right? So, so the investors uh, that are in Singapore are now able to bring co-investors from outside Singapore to, to look at investments in the region. So one of the estimates uh, and, 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 uh, in, in that you've seen circulating around is, is that Singapore, uh, Southeast Asia is probably about 10 years behind where China was in terms of uh, venture. Uh, my personal estimates is a little uh, further behind. I think in terms of number of deals and value invested, uh, it is about 10 years behind. But if you start looking at infrastructure and if you start looking at, at potential, uh, what, Singa what China had 10 years ago was a steady stream of exits and a pipeline of IPOs on the way. So, so 2005 would be the year where, where you know, Baidu was already in the pipeline, where you had Focus Media already in the pipeline, where you had uh, Shanda was already public. So, so you had a whole string of companies and proven, right? That hasn't happened in Southeast Asia yet. I think I think the largest uh, recent deal was probably uh, the trade sale of Vicky to Rakuten, which was two hundred million dollar deal. Uh, you've seen some landmark investments made recently, but and 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 with the amount of investments going in, it's only a matter of time when you start seeing the exits. And when that happens, I think uh, you will see uh, Southeast Asia on an exponential growth. So for those of you thinking about the region. I think it is an opportune time to, to, to think about it. Uh, when you come in uh, after the exponential growth, I think, I think you know, the boat's already left and, uh, and, and uh, it will be sort of playing catch up. So, so this is the right time to be thinking about the market, to start making uh, invest, uh, investments, not so much in, 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 in deals, but in, in partnerships and in being able to building the capability of evaluating some of these deals. So the second part is really about uh, some of the some of the new venture trends that we see uh, coming on uh, in the in the region, right? So I think the first one, uh, because this panel uh, with the title was uh, targeted a limited partners, is, is I think uh, the investment mode that we see from from limited partners is beginning to change, uh, and uh, whether it's driven by by uh, cheaper fees or lower fees or whether it's driven by the ability to cherry pick deals to 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 be able to uh, boost higher returns uh, the trend is there that more and more LPs are asking for co-investment rights and more and more LPs are, are looking to 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 build their own investment teams and, and to do that so across the different type of LPs that we see uh, fund of funds uh, not so much endowments, but, but even sovereign wealth funds, we're beginning to see that, 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 that they are beginning to build their own capabilities to do that. Uh, the reality, though, I think, is that the model, something seems to be wrong with that model. Uh, and I'm not so much talking as a GP saying that the LPs are, are trying to sting on the fees. But, but I think the, the ability for the LPs to react, right? So, so when I, as a GP, am thinking about putting a syndicated deal together that involves my LP, uh, it is often easier going out to other commercial funds than waiting for a response from the LP. 
because as they're building out their capabilities, uh, many of them don't really have the capabilities. Many of them are really uh, have you know one or two people overlooking the relationships with all the funds and all the investment opportunities from there. They they uh, they have the expertise as financial investors to invest, but often are very unsure about about the the space uh, that that we invest in. So so that tends to be a barrier, I think, and, and create some friction uh, in having that model sort of, sort of play out. The other uh, trend that we see, I think, uh, that I have on the slide is, is this, uh, this accelerators. And I think uh, Tim spoke a little bit about maybe there are too many uh, accelerators uh, out there. But the uh, fact is that there are a lot of accelerators out there. Uh, personally, the, the funding model of the accelerator is expensive for the ultimate investor because a fund generally is more economic, charging 2% charging of management fee a year is, is a lower cost than the operational cost of an, of an accelerator. But that being said, the, the, the whole premise of the accelerator uh, and the presence now of angels and this new class of what we call super angels are now are now in a way changing early round funding uh, into startup companies, right? And when I say when I say changing, it's changing in a very big way uh, because when when a million dollars was enough for a Series A investment, today it's five, uh, and and it's basically all the all the bars have been raised. Um, so so the seed round is the new Series A. Uh, and, and deals have become very, very expensive. And so we're seeing an inflation of, of, of valuation and, 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 and uh, across geographies, you're seeing that trend uh, happening right now. So, so uh, Series A investments are becoming very, very expensive. Um, there's another trend, and, and, and this, this I see most prominently in China, uh, where, where I spend more than half my time. Uh, and, and China created a new board uh, for, for listing. We talked a little bit about stock markets uh, in, in the previous uh, discussions. Uh, and this new board called the NNEQ, or, or uh, directly translated the new third board uh, in China, is basically an OTC market uh, that, that allows uh, companies to list and trade uh, uh, very early on. And so we're beginning to see that post super angel round where they raise three, four hundred thousand dollars, they go direct to listing and, and, and you know the success stories you hear that a year later they're a unicorn. Right? Uh, I remember uh, speaking with Neil Shen at Sequoia one day and, and he was telling about his experience in, in in discussing unicorns of China and you know because of the uh, valuations of the Chinese stock market, uh, you know, unicorns are actually quite common in China uh, if they list on if they list on the Chinese stock exchange. Uh, and a good example is the is Yoku Tudo that listed on Nasdaq versus uh, Le Shi uh, that's listed on the domestic uh, domestic markets. The the valuation is 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 manifold different. When the business of Lesh is, is actually was actually a lot smaller than than uh, their Nasdaq counterparts, but that I think is 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 another trend as well. So 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 qu question not definite is 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 the Series A investors relevant anymore and and uh, and do we have a space uh, in this market? The last point I think I'll talk a little bit about and we can discuss in further detail uh, in the in the panel is crowdfunding, right? Uh, and, and crowdfunding is, 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 is another model that has, that, that has come into play. Now, crowdfunding for, for equity uh, has been problematic. There's been recent press uh, in the U.S. about the Jobs Act and, and how it's not perfect and, and how it's not uh, protecting the retail investor and so on. And different regulations are dealing with that problem in, in, in different ways. But if you look into other areas of crowdfunding, crowdfunding for rewards, you, you, you begin to see that, that actually there is a case for, for crowdfunding uh, in this market, particularly for the hardware-based uh, startups. So you now have a startup company that has a product idea that is able to crowdfund to crowdfund their prototypes uh, and get their initial customers at the, 
at the same time, right? And, and positioning the company for a much larger uh, Series A round. I think the last thing, and I didn't have this on, on, on the bullet point, was I think Marta was the one who mentioned AngelList. And AngelList, I think, is, a, is another uh, relevant point in the sense that if, if a notable investor, not necessarily a VC fund, is able to put a syndicate together because of his known track record investing, uh, that again is another potential model that that could uh, pose a threat to the traditional venture fund that charges a two percent fee and a twenty percent carry. So I think that's all I have. Uh, there, there's the contact detail for the association if you want to find out a little bit more and and, and all that. And back to you. Thank you very much.